Therefore, it's time for members' statements. The member from Nipissing. Thank you, uh, Speaker. I rise today to offer congratulations for the accomplishments made by four talented students from Canador College in Nipissing. Canador College aircraft maintenance students David Gelatly and Jason Lawton have received the highest awards from the Skills Ontario competition. Lawton was awarded the gold and Gelatly silver in the post-secondary aircraft maintenance uh, category of the competition. In other news, recent Canador College graduates Dale Kerrigan and Martin Smith have both been nominated for the prestigious 2017 Northern Ontario Music and Film in Motion Film Awards. Both of the Canador graduates are up for the award of Best Director. Both Kerrigan and Smith have taken home awards from national and international festivals in the past. We wish both of these talented artists the best of success at the award show on May 27th. Canador College continues to provide the people of Nipissing and indeed all of Northern Ontario with the highest levels of quality programming and student services. It's truly wonderful to see success after success coming out of this top-tier educational facility in North Bay. Here, here, Thank, here. You, Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Member Sings, the member from Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. Ontario's health care system is at a tipping point. Hospitals are at capacity, patients are being treated in hallways, and wait times are out of control. This is the reality in our province, and it's the reality in my community of Oshawa. As members of provincial parliament, we've all heard the stories, perhaps so often that the members on the government side have started to forget what these stories mean for real people and real families in our communities. Last week, I spoke with Steve Borders that has waited six months unable to physically pick up his granddaughter while he waits to even receive a date for his shoulder surgery. Six months and still waiting. I also recently met with a man named Barry, who's fighting to navigate our tangled and underfunded long-term care system, acting as caregiver to his wife with, with Alzheimer's. And I heard from Donna and Sarah, both are young women that are struggling to pay their bills and fill prescriptions each month. Donna noted in her email, when a puffer can cost $50 to refill, I'm paying $50 to breathe. In Ontario, you shouldn't have to empty your wallet to get the medicine you need, and no one should ever go without treatment they need because of cost. It's deplorable that this is the reality in our health care system, and it's time for solutions. That's why New Democrats have committed to Ontario's first universal pharmacare program. It's why we will undo the wind government's damage to hospital budgets, and why we want to build a health care system that is available to every Ontarian when they need it. Because, Speaker, we can't afford not to. Thank you. For the member students, the member from Mississauga Streetsville. Well, thank you, Speaker. While visiting my neighbors in Lisgar Meadowvale and Streetsville during the 2007 election, one of the community commitments I made to our Western Mississauga residents was a second extension to our local hospital. First called an ambulatory surgery centre, the project was approved in 2011 and its scope later expanded to become a full fledged new Phase 3 at the hospital. Phase 3 at Credit Valley Hospital is now nearing completion. Constructing Phase 3 has been a bit like expanding a highway while the traffic moves on it. The emergency department has more than doubled to again be a state-of-the-art facility and now has a senior-friendly layout. Phase 3 configures the surgical care area and creates a new 24-bed recovery room with increased privacy. The current diagnostic imaging equipment is expanded. Some existing equipment, including the CT scanner, X-ray, nuclear camera, and ultrasound, have been replaced. Phase 3 co-locates the CT and angiography areas for easier access. Three existing units are combined into one spacious, state-of-the-art area for improved patient care. There are 10 new private rooms, for a total of 29, allowing for better privacy and infection control. Phase three at Credit Valley Hospital is a local commitment made and a local commitment kept in full. Thank you, Speaker.
you. Further member statements, the member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thank you, Speaker. A record number of school closures, as many as 600, are about to become reality in communities across Ontario, including 11 in my riding. And the people of rural Ontario are outraged. Last week, this Liberal government ordered one of its MPPs to host a meeting with concerned community members in a public relations stunt to try and quell concerns. They hired a consultant to conduct the unadvertised meeting at a resort outside Sandbanks Provincial Park that's about as far away from the affected schools as you could get, and on a Friday night. In spite of the government's efforts to make it as difficult as possible, about 100 people showed up, many from Madoc Township, which is more than 100 kilometres away. Organizers say the data from the meeting would be collected and a report completed for July. But, Speaker, many of these schools are slated to close next month. Group after group stressed the need for a pause on the closures, which have been fast-tracked by the Liberals, and the necessity for trustees to ensure they're getting accurate stats from the school board. Prince Edward resident Jennifer Byford said the meeting should have been held months ago. Brad Beal of Bayside said the administration is dismissing parents' concerns and forcing the ministry's agenda. Belleville Mayor Tasso Christopher recently said, I fully support we endorse sending a message to the province that they slow down. We need a moratorium yep. to make sure that we get this right. I think resident Ryan Aldred, a member of the Sophiasburg Community Hub Project, said it best, Speaker, speed kills. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Mr. Member, Mr. Member from Tunis, James Bay. Well, Mr. Speaker, I've got to say uh, I'm a little bit disappointed in the response that I got today uh, on question period in regards to the softwood lumber industry uh, debacle that's going on these days. We all know Chapter 19 under NAFTA, we've been there how many times with our softwood lumber exports? Each and every time we've been found not to have been subsidizing that industry. Each and every time the tribunal has ruled in favour of Canada because, quite frankly, we do not subsidize the forest industry. We have a federal government who's decided that the opening position is we're going to start putting in place uh, programs in order to offset job losses and that they're prepared to renegotiate NAFTA. Renegotiate what? Under Chapter 19, we have a process that works for Canada and works for the United States. Why do we need to renegotiate that just because we have Donald Trump who's decided that he wants to do something different? We negotiated these things in good faith. And what the government has to do federally is to understand we cannot diminish Chapter 19 whatsoever. We can't allow the Americans to change a Chapter 19 process so that it becomes judges that make decisions. Currently, the people that make the decisions are the people that are trade negotiators who understand the issue of trade. And what we need to do is make sure that Chapter 19 works and that we properly staff our 25 people allotment that we're allowed to do. Secondly, if Canada is not prepared to backstop the Ontario industry, Ontario must do it and make sure that our industry is able to survive up until the point of the next hearing where we will yet again win against the United States when it comes on the softwood lumber dispute. Thank you. Further members statement, the member from Ottawa Maria. Sorry, Ottawa Vanier. Mr. Mr. Speaker, the question of access to justice is very concerning. The courts, the legal profession, members of the public are concerned about pressures within the legal system and particularly the inability of the middle class to access law or to access the courts. However, some people are acting to help. Since 2001, in, Ot in Ottawa and across our province, Pro Bono Ontario has been addressing everyday legal needs. Pro Bono Ontario is a charitable organization that coordinates the work of thousands of lawyers who donate their services to people in need. It leverages the resources of the private bar and, in doing so, saves millions of dollars in avoided trials and shortened ones. Their work is behind the scene and is worth celebrating. Last year, during the 15th anniversary of Pro Bono, the, judge, the Chief Judge Justice of Ontario recognized its work. Ontario does great work. It helped pensioners who were lured in fraudulent consumer contracts. It has defended people from predatory lenders. It is at every level of court, from small claims courts to Supreme Court. It operates drop-in centres and courthouses to help people navigate the justice system. It is in every children's hospital in Ontario helping families resolve the legal and work problems that come when you have a, a child that stays long in hospitals. Finally, it works for education and rights of the disabled and disadvantaged school children and nonprofit organizations. 
Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, I am proud of Pro Bono's work and I want to encourage with the good work of Pro Bono. Thank you. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Terry Sound has spoken. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the boating season begins and cottagers fire up their motors, it's important to remind boaters to be respectful, courteous, and safe this summer. Safe Quiet Lakes is an organization that has been advocating for a culture of respect on our lakes for the past six years. Last month, I attended Safe Quiet Lakes annual stakeholders meeting at the Port Carling Community Centre in Muskoka. Their main focus is on education, and they do great work in spreading awareness about the issues and their voluntary code of conduct. The code is simple. Boaters always care. Boaters operate with caution and courtesy. They always keep a 360-degree watch and minimize wake and noise, and they care for passengers, respect regulations, offer life jackets, and safety instruction. This message is extra important this year as boaters and property owners contend with high water levels. This year, even a small wake could do damage to the shoreline or someone's property. I'd like to thank Francis Carmichael and Greg Wilkinson for their continued effort in promoting safer and quieter lakes so that we can all enjoy our beautiful environment. Please take a moment to visit their website at safequiet.ca. Make all prep necessary preparations for a great boating season in Perry Sound, Muskoka, and across Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, for the member from Davenport. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I rise today to inform the House that it is the International Day Against Homophobia, Transphobia, and Biphobia. Today, we are commemorating a day that not long ago, in 1991, when the United Nations removed homosexuality from the international classification of diseases. I am proud of the inclusive society that we have built right here in Ontario. I am proud of the work our government has done by banning gay conversion therapy, providing crisis counselling to LGBTQ youth, and to ensure that the rights of LGBTQ parents are the same as those of all other parents. But it is important that we do not forget that it was not that long ago that members who sit in this House today would be mocked, ridiculed, criminally charged and jailed for who they are and who they love. So today I would ask all members and everyone commemorating this day to not only celebrate the progress that we have made on this issue, but also remember that there is much more work to be done. Our party, our government and I are willing to fight for equality for LGBTQ people, and I hope that members on all sides of this House will continue to do so as well. Because after all, Mr. Speaker, love is love. Thank you. Member Stevens, the member from Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As a strong advocate of community-based initiatives and Ontario PC critic for accessibility, I'm pleased to rise today in recognition of the 30th anniversary of the Ontario Law Enforcement's Torch Run for Special Olympics. With over 75,000 law enforcement personnel involved internationally, the Law Enforcement Torch Run is considered the largest grassroots fundraising event for Special Olympians worldwide. In Ontario, local police officers, border guards and corrections officers have helped raise $35 million since 1987 by taking up the torch and running, jogging and biking over 8,000 kilometres and even taking polar plunges, all in support of enriching the lives of people with an intellectual disability through sport. Spe Special Olympics are a powerful way of helping our 23,000 registered athletes feel and experience hope, power and joy by giving them an opportunity to demonstrate their, their skill and courage. In support of this amazing partnership, I encourage all members to join our law enforcement agencies in amplifying engagement and awareness of Special Olympics by tweeting with the hashtags BeAFan and Guardians of the Flame. Speaker, I'd like to take a second to mention some Special Olympians from my riding. Pip LaCasse from Wyarton, who is a Special Olympic speed skater. Dylan Dawson from Wyarton, his dad at Craig is a good friend of mine. And all of the athletes and coaches and Olympians who have recently competed from Hanover, Owen Sound and area. Thank you to all supporters of the Torch Run, including Acton Staff Sergeant Mike Daze of Owen Sound Police Services for their diligence and commitment to the children, youth and adults with intellectual disabilities. Because of your efforts, the athletes are able to enjoy, compete and represent us at the Games. Finally, I also want to mention that this year our country sent 148 Special Olympics athletes to compete at the Winter Games in Austria. I invite all members to join me in extending our heartfelt thanks to our law enforcement for their unwavering support of Special Olympics and also wishing our athletes and coaches the best at the next Special Olympics Ontario Provincial Winter Games. Finally, Sault Ste. Marie. For those who missed the news, the Sioux will welcome 1,000 athletes, coaches and visitors when it hosts the 2019 Special Olympics Ontario Provincial Winter Games. Thank you, Speaker. I'm sure the member, uh, 
I'm sure the member did a word count, but I'm on the board of the Special Olympics, so I let you go. <laughs> Thank you. I thank all members for their statements. It's therefore time for reports by committees. The member from Oxford. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to.